This question about testosterone and sexual behavior, it's important to distinguish between these different phases of reproduction or reproductive behaviors. So there are studies showing that sexual behavior itself can increase testosterone. There was a study published in 2011 from Escasa et al., E-S-C-A-S-A. This is the stuff of textbooks. This is on PubMed. These are quality studies showing that men who observe sex, so I guess this would be observing pornography, will have slight increases in testosterone during the observation. These people actually were were willing to have blood draws taken while watching pornography. They had increases in testosterone that were very modest of about 10%. Whereas when people participated in sex, they actually did this study where people had blood draws and they had real sex with their partners and they had 70% increases in testosterone. So there are increases in testosterone that are quite significant during the physical act of sex and far less so during observing sex. Now, the question that I often get, in fact, is one of the questions I get most often in the comments on YouTube, I don't know why that is, is whether or not ejaculation adjusts testosterone levels. And it turns out there are two studies that I could find that were quality studies on PubMed that address this, that sex and ejaculation itself does not reduce testosterone levels, although it will increase prolactin levels for the reasons I described a moment ago. However, abstinence or sex without ejaculation for a week or more will increase testosterone levels up to 400%. So the answer is actually complicated. It's not straightforward. What it means is that sex itself increases testosterone. However, abstinence also increases testosterone even further. So it's a nuanced answer. And I hope this is satisfactory, no pun intended, to those of you that have been asking me, what is the relationship between sex and ejaculation and testosterone and dopamine? It is nuanced. And you have to understand that nuance if you want to understand how certain behaviors impact hormones and how hormones impact those behaviors. As I mentioned before, in females, testosterone also primes the motivation to seek out sex. And sex itself also increases testosterone, but it also increases prolactin. So in both men and women, sex increases prolactin post-sex. It's just the way that the system works. It's that testosterone and dopamine increase in the seeking out and the behavior of sex. And then after sex, prolactin levels go up. There's kind of a quiescence. The whole nervous system is promoted towards calm. And this may actually have something to do with pair bonding and the encouragement of individuals to spend more time together to exchange different smells and hormones and maybe even pheromones. And we're going to talk about pheromones in a moment. A few years ago, there was a lot of excitement about the hormone DHEA, which is mainly made by the adrenals. DHEA has been promoted as kind of a catch-all for increasing testosterone and estrogen in males and females. And indeed, DHEA will increase both testosterone and estrogen. This is something to be mindful of if you're thinking about taking DHEA or you're taking DHEA already. DHEA will increase both testosterone and estrogen And the extent to which it increases one or the other will depend on whether or not you're starting off with more estrogen than testosterone or whether or not you're starting off with more testosterone than estrogen and whether or not you have a lot of aromatase. So for individuals that have a lot of aromatase being made by the testes or by body fat, if you take DHEA, there's a good chance that a a fair portion of that is going to be shuttled towards estrogen production and not towards testosterone production. Whereas in individuals that have low levels of testosterone to begin with, high levels of estrogen, there's a good chance that the DHEA is going to promote mainly estrogen production. At least that's what I could find from the research studies that I examined. So the way to think about DHEA, it's a kind of global uh, promoter of the sex steroid hormones and its specific effects are going to depend a little bit on where you started and whether or not you have ovaries or testes. So just as there are behaviors that can increase testosterone, there are behaviors that can decrease testosterone. And one of the most well-characterized ones in humans is becoming a parent. So expecting fathers have an almost 50% decrease in testosterone levels, both free and bound testosterone. As well, their cortisol levels, a stress hormone, drop by almost threefold, which is incredible. And their estradiol levels double. So their estrogen levels double. So expecting fathers 
many people have known put on additional body weight. Everyone always thought that it's because they're eating in parallel with their pregnant wife. But it turns out that these effects of reduced testosterone, increased estradiol, and reduced cortisol can all be explained by an increase in prolactin. So not just in humans, but in other species as well. When the male and female of that species are expecting young, they lay down more body fat. The assumption is that this is to prepare for long nights of no sleep, which occurs in many species, not just in humans. So it's really interesting that this hormone prolactin can start suppressing whole categories of hormones, sex steroid hormones, and can start increasing whole categories of other ones. So we hear about the dad bod. There are a lot of explanations for the dad bod um, that extend well beyond this podcast episode, but it is a well-known phenomenon that testosterone is going to drop, prolactin is going to increase, estradiol is going to increase in males and females that are expecting children. Now, how long that lasts is very interesting. It actually has to do with how much contact and how much contact with the smells of the baby, of the offspring the father happens to have. So how available or unavailable he is will actually impact his level of hormones. Now, I am definitely not promoting the idea that fathers or mothers take time away from their offspring in order to keep their testosterone levels high or to restore them. It's not what I'm saying at all. It's just interesting to point out that these evolutionary mechanisms push us toward or bias us toward particular categories of behaviors by influencing our hormones, which then feed back and promote more of that particular behavior. Because as I mentioned before, peaks in testosterone in males and females cause individuals to seek sex, not promote parenting. Whereas reductions in testosterone, increases in prolactin and decreases in cortisol move individuals of both sexes toward parenting behavior and less toward reproductive behavior. The other behavior that markedly reduces testosterone in both males and females and markedly reduces the desire for seeking sex and sex itself is illness. And many of you might say, well, duh, when people feel sick, they don't feel like seeking out mates and they don't feel like having sex. But have you ever wondered why that actually is? Well, it turns out that it can be explained by the release of what are called inflammatory cytokines. So cytokines are related to the immune system. They travel in the lymph and in the blood and they attack invader cells like bacteria and viruses. And under conditions of illness, we make a lot of different cytokines. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, but some of them are pro-inflammatory. And the best known example of a pro-inflammatory cytokine is IL-6. And it's known that IL-6, when injected into individuals, will decrease the desire for sex and eventually will reduce levels of testosterone and estrogen, independent of feeling lousy. So the reason why people don't want sex when they're sick is because levels of IL-6 are increased. Now, this is important because as we start to think about the different ways to modulate the sex steroid hormones, so-called optimize the hormones, keeping levels of IL-6 low is going to be important for them to exert their effects. 